everyone, and welcome to Lying Around Connecticut with Carol and Harry. I am Carol Kearns. My husband, Harry Shu, is our co-host. Our mission for the show is twofold. To provide information about Connecticut Lions events and to showcase the many different organizations and causes that Lions support locally, regionally, and internationally. Harry? Good evening and welcome. Please consult our website at www.lions23b.org or your district spirit for more information on coming events. Hello everyone and welcome to Lion Around Connecticut with Carol and Harry. Welcome back to part two of our District 23B orientation which was held at Camp Happy Hill oh, in yes. Unionville. So <laughs> on with the show. On avant. We run three centers that deal primarily with the elderly. That macular degeneration tends to be an elderly disease. Diabetic retinopathy comes uh, at any age, but again, tends to be somewhat of an elderly. Uh, we also deal with, with folks that have industrial concerns with their site. But we have three centers here in District 23B. We have many throughout the state of Connecticut, but we're District 23B, so I want to talk about us. We have a center up in Torrington, we have one in Bristol, we have one in New Britain. Essentially at some point, particularly with macular degeneration, a patient's going to go into their eye care professional who's going to say, you know what, I can't do anything for you. Macular degeneration is not curable. All you can do is slow it down. <coughs> but it's nevertheless leading toward eventual blindness. So what happens to an individual when they go into the eye doctor and the glasses aren't going to work anymore? You're past that now. Hopefully the eye care professional says to you, let's go to the Lions Low Vision Center. At the Low Vision Center, you get to work with an occupational therapist because all three centers are affiliated with the local hospital. It's a partnership that we do as Lions. So you've got an occupational therapist working with you on safety in your home, whether you need certain types of lamps, what the layer will do to you, what certain kinds of backgrounds. Believe it or not, there are colors that help you see better the distinction. I believe black on yellow is a lot better than black on white, believe it or not. Okay. Thank you, Peter saying yes, so I guess I'm right. working with that. But in addition to that, you might need a magnifier, handheld magnifier. You might need a, a $3,500 magnifying machine. None of that usually is provided by your insurance carrier. And it certainly is not provided by Medicare or by anything the state of Connecticut will do for you. It's provided by your Lions Club. The average client walks out of a low vision center with approximately two to three hundred dollars worth of devices, as we call them, given to them free of charge by the Lions Club. When your club donates, you donate to the low vision center. You're donating for someone to walk out of that center having what they need in terms of, of literally a mechanical aid that will help them see. Sometimes it's a special lamp. Sometimes it's a handheld magnifier with, with, uh, with lighting. And sometimes, and I've literally delivered a large machine, the $3,500 machine, it looks like a, an old-fashioned desktop computer. That literally, you put the printed material in, and it magnifies the material. You talk about being a lion. In my experience in terms of when I became a lion, was when I delivered that machine to an elderly patient in Bristol, because I'm a member of the Bristol Club. And we sponsor that low vision center. So when they call and they say, we need someone to deliver this machine, <coughs> one of our lines goes out with that machine. <clears throat> and just knowing that I made a difference in that woman's life was amazing to me. That's when I became a line, not when I got the pit, when I performed that kind of service. So that's what low vision does. 
Our job is to provide devices to the visually impaired, not totally blind. We don't, we don't think the, the place of the state in terms of working with someone who is permanently totally blind. Our focus is more on folks that unfortunately are in that range between being helped by the normal kinds of things, principally eyeglasses and, and contacts, and total blindness. There is, there is a level on that continuum. And believe it or not, there are thousands of people in the state of Connecticut that you can help as lions in this particular situation. Again, it takes a physician's referral. You just don't walk in off the street and say, I want a magnifier. So again, we, we operate as an extension of the medical services. And we take anybody. You don't have to necessarily be in District 23B uh, resident in, in uh, one of our communities. We've had folks come from Fairfield County, New Haven County, because our folks go down to those low vision centers. There are about a dozen low vision centers between the three districts around the state of Connecticut. So, what are we all about in major endeavors? And I'll turn this over to Alan. Okay. Well, Alan's already talked about um, Lions Pugs International Foundation. We've talked about clerk, we've talked about low vision. I've talked about doing screenings for youth. We also have the ability of doing adult screenings. We have a machine because adults tend to be able to, to uh, sit down and concentrate a little bit. So we have a desktop machine that literally will allow us to screen uh, for, again, a number of, of uh, eye conditions. We have people walk out never realizing that they're the, they the beginnings of macular degeneration. So they go through our screening. And our screening says you need to go to an eye care professional. You've got an issue here. Leo Clubs. We are into youth service. We have approximately, I believe, 50 plus Leo Clubs in our district alone. These are principally high school connected clubs, although there are some middle school clubs. And there are some clubs that are just general community clubs, not affiliated with the school. But these tend to be kids who are basically uh, age, well, grade six up to grade 12. And they're service-oriented clubs. We want kids to be able to practice their desires to perform service because kids are very service-oriented for the most part. I can tell you that as an educator. And we're hoping that if we instill in them the idea that service is something, that they get something back in the heart, that as an adult, they'll continue serving to get that back in terms of what it does for them. Diabetes Camp, Allen's our chair here in District 23B. I think he's the chair around the state. Um, he's, he's Mr. Diabetes <coughs> We've been able the last couple of years um, working with, with the uh, Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and I believe uh, you did Yale New Haven this, this past year. Yeah, just come on board. Just on board. Um, providing a summer experience for kids with diabetes. How many of you went to summer camp as a kid? Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys Club? I did Boys Club the first time. Okay. It's a neat thing to do. You get away, your parents get rid of you for a week or two. Uh, you get rid of them for a week or two. You have a good time. But imagine that you've got diabetes, particularly juvenile diabetes, type 1 diabetes as a, as a child. How comfortable are you as you, as a parent, releasing your kid to go off to summer camp? How comfortable is your kid going off to summer camp? With diabetes, you can have a lot of issues with diabetes as a kid. But how would you feel if you had a specialized camp where you knew that the medical staff and the counseling staff were intimately aware of what could happen with you and were on the lookout for those signs and were taking care of you. And we think of what it does for the kid, but I can tell you as someone who has dealt with, with being a caregiver in a situation, the caregiver needs that respite too. It's not just the kid going off to have a good time. Mom and dad need to have a little bit of a break from always worrying and always working and focusing on that kid. 
We do the same thing with Camp Rising Sun, although it is not a lion's activity per se. The red are all things that we are, are pretty much the supporting organization for. What you'll see in the blue Camp Rising Sun, so I'm on the idea of kids with chronic diseases. Camp Rising Sun is up in Camp Jewel up in Colebrook. We sponsor that in terms of, of helping to financially uh, organize that. And it's for kids with cancer. The same idea. Let those kids be kids. They go up there for a week, have a good time, but the staff knows what's going on in terms of medically with those kids. Great relief for the uh, parents. I think you're going to do my favorite if you win, so I'm going to skip the yeah. I'm going to slide it comes up. Eyeglass collections got it. If anyone says, I'm in Lions, what's the first thing someone says to you, probably? Veteran Lions, what do they say to us? You're the guys that collect the eyes. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Once a year, we bring our eyeglasses uh, to be collected from club to club. And Governor, what did we have? About 26,000 last year? At least. Well, just, yeah. just in, just in our back side back. here, just in our side of the district, and you could probably double that for the other side. So we collected almost 60,000 pairs of used prescription eyeglasses. They get sent to a processing center in New Jersey. Now, my wife has gone on several eye missions down into Central America. I can't pronounce the Nicaragua. I can't get it out, so I'll just say Central America. Okay. This was not through Lions. It was through the, the Volunteer Ophthalmologist Association. But guess who, whose glasses they took with them? They took our glasses. In five days, they, they provided assistance to 4,000 people who never see an eye care provider, who have no access to prescription eye care. 4,000 people. She's done that now three years, 4,000 a year, just in this one country. That's what those, so someone says, what do, you, what do you do with those eyeglasses? They go walk to, to underdeveloped countries. Unfortunately, uh, our federal laws do not allow us to uh, recycle them here in the United States because they're considered prescription. So, you know, you wouldn't give your penicillin off to your neighbor if you can't give your glasses off to your neighbor. But there's an awful lot of people out there who have no access to eye care except when the lines show up. Our Peace Poster Contest, we are a global organization. Again, we are a youth-oriented organization to some extent. Peace Poster is a junior high, middle school activity where kids around the world take the theme of peace and graphically try to, to indicate to us as adults how they see peace and how they see peace unfolding in the world. It's an international contest. So they get entries from all over the world. Very quickly, uh, the other remaining blue activities, Connecticut Radio Information System. If you've ever had a relative who's totally blind, it's a special radio because it operates at a frequency that you and I cannot get on our, our home radio. But it's literally a radio that volunteers will read the Hartford Current, the Bristol Press, the Britain Herald, the obituaries, <laughs> what's on sale at the Stop and Shop this week. They literally have people sit there and literally read newspapers. And that's how these folks can get uh, the information they need um, in terms of, of being totally sightless. New Dimension, they're also creating um, QR code exhibits in museums around around Connecticut. You take your, we're all familiar with QR codes, unfortunately, because they're cold in every restaurant now. You go in there, it's a QR code for your menu. But you literally take your cell phone and if you're totally sightless, and for example, you're wandering through the Carousel Museum in Bristol, or the Agricultural Museum in South Windsor, or, Windsor, or, you're, or you're down at Mystic Seaport, you can hold your phone up. You don't have someone with you trying to explain to you what that exhibit's all about. They just point your phone to that QR code and your phone talks to you. It's 
So my club just just did about three years ago. We did the, the carousel in the first time. You can go through there as a sightless person, and it will tell you what the exhibit's all about. Helps you feel independent. The Delco guide dog. Those are the folks that you see who are, are around the service dogs. Uh, they're blind, and those are uh, trained dogs. I think the last figure I heard was about fifty thousand dollars to train one of those dogs for one person. So that dog that you see walking through with that blind person is about a $50,000 investment, some of which we've contributed as Connecticut Lions. It's up in Bloomfield, so we sort of think we own it in terms of, of, of having an obligation. And our good photographer here is on the, uh, the advisory board uh, for the uh, Fidelco the Group. American School for the Deaf in West Hartford. We have a, uh, an annual dinner with them. Uh, we've given them enough money to equip the computer lab there at the school. I think the room is named after us. And uh, generally, we come in about five, $6,000 a year of donations to them, again, to help with that. So I have talked enough, and I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yep, let me tell you all about our involvement with young people. Uh, there is a Leo program. Yep. Uh, this is for people under the age of 18 uh, who would like to take part in all of this uh, fun stuff. Uh, there are now, I think, about 40-something 40, 40 Leo clubs around the state of Connecticut. Um, they're uh, in high schools mainly, but also middle schools. Um, Lions, uh, adult Lions, uh, help them out to do some of the things and participate in many of the things that we do as far as fundraisers and service uh, activities. Uh, the International Peace Poster have touched upon uh, some of the most magnificent artwork from all around the world. If you get a chance to ever see it, uh, it's just uh, stunning. Uh, special needs camp, cancer and diabetes, uh, local school scholarships, Many of the clubs give scholarship uh, under the name of Lions to their local uh, high schools. Uh, and Lions Trust <coughs> is a program that uh, we actually took over from a commercial organization uh, to go into schools and uh, uh, provide for their needs that teachers can't provide for. You all um, know perhaps the D.A.R.E. program. Um, this is a similar program to DARE, uh, but much more educationally and service-oriented. I would say the United Nations. That's an interesting story. Back in the, the 1940s, when the United Nations was being formed, uh, they needed somebody to write the non-governmental organization part of the UN Charter. And they turned to none other, other than our uh, original benefactor, Melvin Jones. Uh, he wrote the NGO portion of the UN Charter. Now, ever since then, Lions, anyone who wants to come, can come to the UN on a special day, usually around March sometime, um, and just sit in the, the halls of the United Nations and listen to uh, UN speakers and listen to what's going on and get a feel for our connections with the line with the uh, United Nations organization, mainly something called School in a Box, where the Lions contribute to putting together an entire school program with all of the pens and pencils and notepads, anything other than the building to ship to a foreign country where kids can sit out under a tree with a teacher and get the kind of learning that they should be getting at a young age. Um, so that's our connection to the United Nations. Now the last time I was down there, there were, uh, what, close to 2,000 people there. There were people from Italy, there were people from some of the Asian countries, they come from all over the world for this one day at the United Nations. 
conventions and seminars. Uh, if you want to, you can spend the rest of your life going to conventions and seminars for lions, but not for uh, In uh, February, there's a midwinter conference that will be held here, <coughs> excuse me, in the state of Connecticut. Um, and a state convention that will be held in May, uh, also for all lines in the state of Connecticut. Uh, the international convention in July is, has been sensational. When you think about the fact that some of the larger political conventions that have been held gather maybe 10,000 people, we, the Lions, gather 20 to 40,000 people for our profession. Uh, they're held all over the world, and uh, just uh, the nations put in for them five, six years in advance, and so you know where you may be going on vacation five or six years from now. Uh, the USA Canada Forum is mainly a learning session for Lions to come together and a hundred different seminars and teaching units uh, that will uh, provide you with knowledge about anything specific in the world of Lions. There are emerging Lion Institutes, you have some of them in that sheet that we handed out. Alliance leadership programs of all kinds, and faculty development institutes for those of us who don't have the ability to stand up here and do what I'm doing and what I'm doing. Um, it, it's, it's really the amount of training that is offered by Lions to you uh, is, is amazing and is not only useful in the Lions world, but as well in your business and daily activities. Uh, Lions Magazine. I had a copy of it somewhere. I think it's in that brown case. Anyway, uh, it comes out four times a year. Um, uh, are any of the six new Lions here getting it yet? It was an issue that just came out. No? Let me, uh, let me just take a second and dig it out. Let me just pass it around and look at it.
we serve. That's what it's all about. Uh, we have just a minute, I want to tell you a story. When we talked about um, curing blindness uh, overseas, our influence around the world. There is a disease, onchocoriasis, which is actually known as river blindness. We, there may be one of you in the room who knows about that, but most, to most of us it's an enigma. River blindness is caused by the little parasites in the waters and rivers and streams mainly in equatorial countries around the world. It has a habit of getting into the human body through any kind of an opening or cut or saw or anything like that. Um, and you can imagine that some of the people in some of these countries in equatorial Africa and America, the Americas, um, use the rivers and streams for just about everything. This little parasite has a habit of working its way up into the smallest uh, blood vessels anywhere in the body. And unfortunately, the smallest blood vessels are in the eye. <coughs> and in many countries in Africa, 10 or 15 years ago, if you went over there, you would find that most of the people above the age of 20 or either blind or going blind. We here in Connecticut had a lion who happened to be an eye doctor working in, uh, at um, UConn Medical Center. And in his laboratory, he worked on the idea of providing a very small amount of poison. That is a very interesting story about river blindness. So come back next week for the conclusion of that story and the end of District 23B orientation. That'll do it for this episode of Lion Around Connecticut with Carolyn Harry. Bye now. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed our show this evening. Tune in next week for another Lion Around Connecticut with Carol and Harry. Good night. Bye-bye.